Okay, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. This is from St. Paul's second letter to Timothy. Now you have observed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, my sufferings, which befell me at Antioch, in Iconium and Lystra, with what persecutions I endure, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceivers and deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, no one from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to instruct you for all salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and never shall be, well without end. Amen. St. Catherine of Siena, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, welcome. Welcome to our first session. Um, while the book that we're going to cover is the book of Genesis, the theme, the theme is going to be covenant. Father Kunin and I, well, first of all, also welcome to those watching on YouTube as well. Uh, you know, that type of thing. Again, I'm not very good at this, but, uh, but anyways, let's go to the story I was going to say here. It's realizing how much Father and Kunin and I were kind of born people. You know, because we're talking theology and spirituality stuff, especially last night. And, you know, we were saying how a lot of Christians and a lot of Catholics out there, like, they see this faith as solely just not doing bad things. Like, that, that's like... You tell them what it means to be Catholic, and it's like, well, you know, I'm a good person. I don't kill people. I don't steal. You know, and then Father Kuna added, yeah, and then some people also, they just see this faith as going to Mass so that they don't go to hell. <laughs> you know, like, that's it. So just imagine, we exist. We exist, and we exist through no effort of our own. Like, we came to existence from powers outside of ourselves. And for us, in our faith, we say, well, yeah, God, God is the first word. God, you know, willed us, you know, into existence, willed the human person into existence through his word, which we'll see, we'll see, look at next week, willed him in his, into existence. And then gives this human person this great capacity for love. You know, like love, love and a lack of love in our lives has a great impact on us. Mentally, emotionally, physically, you know, like we, we, we feel horrible. We, we're in this deep depression if we really firmly believed we are not loved in this life. It's a very devastating thing to live through, but also a very, very joyful very life-giving thing when you know that you are loved and in love. And so we exist and we have this great capacity to love and now when it comes to our God, it's go to church and don't do bad things. I no longer want to settle there. And this is why I'm doing this. Because this, while hopefully you'll learn many things in this book, first and foremost, ultimately, it's about a God who is coming in search of us. And the number one desire of his, as revealed by him, is that he wants to enter into a covenant with you. 
Now that word might not mean anything to us right now, but hopefully it will through, you know, the next seven to eight weeks. So like I said, I have a slideshow here, and Marcy, if you want to go on it as well, um, I, again, I have to apologize. The, just the first, this first session, depending on where you're at in your faith, it might be very beneficial or it might be like, okay, I already know all these things. But I have to make sure that we are all on the same page when it comes to the study of sacred scripture. But not only just the study, but also the meditation. Because again, when we look at these three points here, and again, these first couple of slides are coming right from the catechism. Okay, and again, my eyesight's getting bad here. I'm gonna have a hard time seeing these words, so I'm gonna bring it up here on my phone here. But sacred scripture ultimately, first and foremost, is the word of God, but expressed in human words. The word of God expressed in human words. And so scripture is going to be a work first and foremost of God, but also in cooperation with God, the work of the human person. Scripture is very incarnational. What do I mean by that? Well, when we say incarnation, we, we refer to what? The divine person of Jesus Christ, who is fully divine, and also fully human. It's the divinity, but the divinity with our humanity. And so Jesus incarnational, he reveals, has a reveal. He takes flesh and uses our words and our culture and our gestures, uses our humanity to convey his divine word. Sacred scripture is the same thing, okay? That's why the church venerates scripture the same way she venerates the Lord's body. It's, it's divine revelation. This is, this is God coming to us. You know, so often you hear these big spiritual gurus, new age people out there, you know, talking about what, like our, our journey of faith and climbing a mountain to meet God and to find God and to, and, and to go and reach God. And no, not in the Christian. Christian... It's God becoming man. It's God descending to us. It's God in search of you and me. God comes to you. God created you. And God fell in love with you. I mean that. Okay. And so again, again, just preliminary stuff here okay preliminary stuff here but it's important inspiration when you think of inspiration what do you think of first and foremost like like how do we picture when we say the books are inspired the human writer is inspired by god i bet you many of you come and you have this vision you know if you were to imagine what that would look like that it's in your minds the, the voice of god saying matthew matthew Write this down, or an angel appearing to Luke. Luke, here, grab a pencil. Write down what I'm going to tell you. You know, that's not what the church means by inspiration, but people do believe that, okay? They believe that. Or they believe in another theory where the, uh, the human person just kind of gets into this trance, you know? Marcy's just sitting there, and all of a sudden, She's in this trance and she stands up and walks over and grabs a pen and a paper and starts writing down in this trance-like state. Nope, that's not inspiration. And then modern day scholars will propose a negative assistance of theory where the human writer is writing, do, 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 you know, just writing down. And then when he's about to make a mistake, God intercedes and says, well, no, no, you got to go this way. No, that's not inspiration either. Okay. Inspiration is what? Inspiration is God working, inspiring through the human writer, through the human writer's culture, his language, his genre. Again, fully a work of God and fully a work of man. It's important that when we talk about inspiration, that it's fully a work of God, fully a work of man, man having full use of his will and capacities. And so as we study sacred scripture and as we meditate on it, we have to know 
What's the culture that he's writing into? What's the worldview that he's writing into? What type of style, what genre is he writing into? What's the genre, what's the style of writing around the culture in which the person lived? What's the geography? Boy, I love geography. You're going to see my first map, okay, tonight, all right? Love geography. I was a geography champ in seventh grade at Cabrini Academy, just in case you did not know that. I will repeat that at least a couple more times over the next eight weeks, okay? Wait till you see what I'm doing to the seventh graders on Thursday. It's like the first five slides are maps. <laughs> they want to know about the world Jesus came from. Okay, all right. I'll be happy to oblige, all right? So scripture, inspiration, not a voice from heaven talking to the writer, not the writer being in a trance, or not the writer what we call negative assistance, where God's not involved in the process until the human writer is making a mistake. God's fully involved, so is the writer, but we have to know everything about the writer and the world that he's writing into to get the full impact of the words that are written in this wonderful book. If you have questions, ask them throughout any time of the presentation. I'll repeat the questions because it probably won't come up on the audio on YouTube. And none of you will be on camera too. So um, if you want to be on camera, you have to sit behind me, okay? All right. Inspiration, fully again. Inspiration, work of God, work of man. How, how do we interpret it? Do you have a lot of leeway in your interpretation of scripture? Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially when you're doing it in prayer. But there are still some boundaries. Okay? There are still some boundaries. And as you look at number three, is there a pointer on this? No, there is one here. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Don't tell Dave I'm using his thing here. All right? But right here, this number three here, three criteria for interpreting scripture. Content and unity of the whole scripture. Okay? So we're not interpreting passages that are going to contradict, at least in terms of our salvation, contradict other passages in scripture. And we're also not going to interpret in a way that's going to go against the teachings of the church, the living tradition of the church, the oral tradition, the teaching of the apostles, whatever you want to call it. Okay, you got you to see scripture and the oral tradition has two pillars, you know. They both feed off each other. Because remember, scripture, especially the New Testament, is going to come from the living oral tradition. You know, the teachings of the apostles, the living tradition, that came first. The first letters of St. Paul are written about 20, 25, 30 years later. And the gospel is soon right after that. Okay, so the teachings of the church are just as critical, okay, to how we understand and read scripture. Again, these are the boundaries. I think the boundaries are wide, but there's still some. And this last one, again, analogy of the faith, okay, coherence of truths among themselves within the whole plan of revelation. It's really just related to A and B, okay. We're not here to contradict scripture. We're not here to contradict the teachings of the church, okay? And then when we, when we interpret scripture, there's really four ways to do it. As I said, the boundary, the boundary is large, okay? So there's really ultimately two senses, okay? Uh-oh. There we go, okay. The literal and the spiritual, but there's three subcategories under the spiritual. That's why there's four, okay? The literal sense, notice right here, not to be confused with the literalist. They're two different things. Okay? Literalist sense is going to ignore the genre, the culture, the author, the intentions of the author. It's going to ignore all those things and just read the words at face value. Okay? A literalist sense. We don't do that. Okay? The literal sense is what? Studying the author's intentions, style, background, culture, genre, and many other things. Okay. We're going to look at the literal sense. What is the author trying to tell us? Because what the author is trying to tell us is also what God is trying to tell us. 
Again, scripture incarnational. But then you can also go into the spiritual sense, allegorical, moral, and anagogical. Okay? The allegorical sense is going to, especially in terms of the Old Testament, interpret things in light of the person of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you an example. Okay? I'm going to give you an example in the next slide of how to do this. The moral sense is going to understand Scripture in terms of how we should act. Okay? And the anagogical is going to interpret Scripture in terms of what one's personal end destiny. Okay. So, here's the passage. The passage, and hopefully you guys might be familiar with this. If not, we'll cover this in the spring. The passage is the book of Exodus. And the passage is the crossing of the Red Sea. Okay, so Moses is leading the people down. There's the Red Sea. Moses raises his hand. The Red Sea parts. They cross, reach to the other side. The waters collapse on the Egyptians. Okay. Anyone out here? How would you interpret that in the allegorical sense? That is, relating that sense to the person of Jesus Christ. Where is Jesus Christ hidden in that passage? Think of your knowledge of him in the New Testament. Give us a shot. Go ahead. Very good. Slavery to freedom, right? The crossing of the Red Sea is what is the definitive moment where the Egyptians are no longer slaves, but they're now free people and they're children of God through the waters of the Red Sea. Slavery to freedom. And that's exactly what Jesus does. And he talks about it in the gospel passage, right? Slavery from sin to freedom as beloved child, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ. Excellent. How about moral? You know, how we should act. Okay, I got one. How about trusting in God? Trusting in his word? Because there was a lot of reluctancy when they got to that sea, right? A lot of grumbling, a lot of complaining. You know, a lot of lack of trust against, against God. So how should we act? What? Put in our faith in God and his word. Anagogical. Again, from Egypt to freedom, what's our destiny? Heaven. From this fallen world to the right hand, the right side of God the Father. That's where we're moving. And how do we get there? We get there through what? Through the waters of baptism. If you're familiar with the Easter, Easter vigil text, okay, and that's just the, the Passover and the cross on the Red Sea up in there. But, you know, the Passover events, uh, uh, the Easter vigil talks about and mentions when we do the baptism, mentions about one of the symbols of baptism is what? Is the cross into the Red Sea. Okay. So that's, that's the... Any questions on interpretation, inspiration? Go ahead. Okay. So... I would say you can, you can read each passage and try to find something with those four senses. Some might be easier than others to do that, okay? Some there might not really be, you know, if you're, if you're reading something minute, I'm trying to think of like a very insignificant passage in the Old Testament, I'm in a hard time doing it because there really isn't many. You know, even, believe it or not, even like the boring genealogies, have some deep Christological impact, <laughs> you know. They really do. Um, the genealogies, also in terms of morality, you look at the genealogies, you can spot who are the good ones, who are the bad ones, you know, those types of things. Um, so some passages are easier than others. Some passages will um, easily relate to the moral sense and not so much to the anagogical sense or to the allegorical sense. All the parishes is though, we're going to look at it in the literal sense. That is, studying what is, what's the author's intention? What is he trying to convey? What's the culture? What's the background? What's the genre around it? We're all, we're going to look at that, okay? And those types of things. So, yeah. So, yeah. Oh, excellent question. Excellent question in, in all that. All right. Let's get started. Okay. So, here. We're not going to look at any passages in particular tonight. But this is just an introduction to the book of Genesis. Um, some of the sources um, that I use, the major one is going to be Bat Brad Petrie's Introduction to the Old Testament. Excellent work. I was dying and looking for a good Catholic 
commentary on the Old Testament. Finally, one came out about a couple years ago. So, again, some people get excited about winning the lottery. I get excited about Old Testament commentaries, okay? This shows you the type of person I am here. But uh, um, Jeff Cavins, store, um, Bible Timeline, excellent. Uh, I haven't done it in a couple years, um, but I'm sure a couple things that, that he says uh, that will still be in the back of my mind. Um, uh, so again, just uh, several sources. If there's any other things that you, that you want as like additional reading, just come see me uh, after the session here. But this book of Testament, this Genesis, within the Old Testament and within the Pentateuch, it's a great book. It's the first book in the Bible. Okay, um, so let's look at it here. How familiar are you with the Old Testament? Raise your hands. No one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Most Catholics aren't. Boy, but it, it's, and this is what Jeff Cavins does uh, beautiful with the Bible timeline. You know, it, there really is a nice, nice chronological account of events that leads up to the person of Jesus Christ. You know, we begin with like Genesis, which is the beginning of the Hebrew people. And it goes from the beginning of the human people to Egypt. The story of the book of Genesis ends in Egypt. Then you get Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, where you go from slavery to Egypt to freedom and the wilderness. And then when they're in the wilderness, Moses doesn't get to the wilderness. I'm sorry, Moses doesn't get to the promised land. Moses dies in the wilderness at the end of the book of Deuteronomy. But then afterwards, we have what this period of Joshua where there's a lot of conquests. They are obtaining the land in which God has given them. And then this period of judges, what is that? Well, judges is a period where they have this loose leadership, but it's also one of the most morally bankrupt times in the, in, the, in the history of the Hebrew people during the book of Judges. They have really, in terms of the covenant, really gone off the wall. And, it, and there's like these cycles in Judges where it's the people sin, they get conquered by some Canaanite city-state, they are rescued by a judge, okay, that's what they call them, a judge, and then they sin again, conquered, rescued by a judge. It happens like seven times. It's at the end of the book where they're like, you know what, we're sick of this. We want a king. And that's into the next period. Okay, number four. The kingdom established, divided, and then also conquered. First and second Samuel, first and second Kings. It ends with the exile of the nation of Israel first by the Assyrians and then by the Babylonians. Can't wait till we get to that part. And then the return to the land, along with foreign occupiers, Ezra, Nehemiah, 1st and 2nd Maccabees. They lose the land that God has given them. They return, but not everyone returns. They return about 50 years later. The Hebrew people, that is, back to Israel. Why? Well, many of them got comfortable of where they're at. I found a nice Greek wife. I got it in my business. I'm not going back to that land that's been decimated 50 years earlier. In fact, when Nehemiah and Ezra, when they get back, what's like the first thing they do? They, they wail, they lament. The temple destroyed, the palaces, the great nation destroyed, they have to rebuild. Boy, this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this. I think our church right here in America, I don't know about the rest of the world, but the church right here in America, I see it has a rebuilding. We got to rebuild. You know, I, I, don't, I don't care what, what you think about COVID and should we have masks or not have masks. I don't know what the right answer is. I'm not saying I did have the right answer, but I can tell you the effect of it is a lot of people have not come back, not back to Mass, not, they have not come back to worship, they have not come back to renew the covenant. That's a fact. Again, leaving aside whether we should have had Mass or not have Mass, I'm not getting into that. 
I'm just saying the effect of it, the consequence. This is time, again, to know that God wants to enter into a covenant and he wants you to have life and life to the fullness, to get more out of this faith than just being, okay, go to church and don't sin. No, no, there's more. There's more that he wants to give you. Genesis is one of five books in the Pentateuch, okay? It's called the Pentateuch, which means five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, okay? First five books in the Scripture, in the Old Testament. And there is kind of a, again, a long extended story being told here, beginning with Genesis and ending with Deuteronomy. Check this out. What do you think is the most, I don't want to say the most important book, but one of these books, one of those five books, is the center of the whole Pentateuch. What book do you think that is? Take a guess. You have a 20% chance. Exodus. No, I'm just saying some people say Exodus. Anybody say anything else? It's Leviticus. Here's why. Here's why. Yeah, Leviticus, that, that big, long born book. Why is it Leviticus? Leviticus. Here, here's, here's, here's the clue right here. Here's how we know this. Moses goes to Pharaoh. What does Moses say? Let my people go, right? He says something else right after that. Anybody know? He gives the reason why Pharaoh should let the people go. There's a purpose. It's to what? It's to worship. Let my people go, let God's people go so they can go to the desert and worship him. Again, covenant and worship. These books, this is, this is all about who, all five of these. Who are you? Who are you going to worship? Who are you going to worship? All right, who are you going to worship? Because when we look at the patterns here, Genesis is like the prologue, telling the past and looking towards the future. Okay, so that's what we're going to, we're going to look at the prologue. We're going to look at the past as well as a glimpse towards the future. And in Exodus 1 through 19, it's going to be Israel's journey from Egypt to Mount Sinai. That's going to be important. Again, we're going to do this. We're going to do Exodus during Lent. We have to do Exodus during Lent because... They go together like peanut butter and jelly. Um, Lent and the season of Exodus, the uh, book of Exodus, that is. But Mount Sinai, what's going to happen at Mount Sinai? A covenant's going to be formed there. A covenant to worship. Okay? Mount Sinai is huge, very important. And then Exodus 20 to 40 is going to be Israel at Mount Sinai preparing for the journey, preparing to leave. Okay? Leviticus is the center of the book. Why? Because it's the rules and guidelines for the liturgy. It's a book essentially on how to worship. Because worship is key. It's going to be, again, covenant and worship. And then when you get into Numbers, book number 4, verses 1 to 10, it's going to be Israel at Sinai preparing to leave, okay? And then um, 11 to 36, they're going to head towards the plains of Moab. They're going to get very close I'm going to get very close to the land. Do you know the story? What happens? What happens when they get close? They send some scouts into, into the land to check it out. I think they sent 11 of them in there. What happens? What's that? Yeah, they're scared. Okay, they're, they're reluctant to go. Why? Because they look scary and fierce and and God has led us here to die it's only Joshua and one other person who are like no with the help of the Lord we can take them we can take them with the help of the Lord you can do anything with the help of the Lord you can even say to this mulberry tree be uprooted and be planted into the sea you remember that passage oh well I don't remember that that was, that was Sunday's gospel reading okay <laughs> all right Sunday's Gospel reading, if you have a faith the size of a mustard seed, 
you know? Boy, that, that, was, that was my retreat. It was, I didn't know that was even the gospel passage until the end of my retreat. That was my whole retreat. Because I, I have a litany. My spirituality is pretty much, I have a litany of things that I'm whining and complaining about to God. And God's just like, just, just trust. Ask for the impossible, you know? Ask for the impossible and all that. So what happens, though, they come back, they convince the people that going to this land was a terrible idea, and the people rebel against Moses, and what happens? They remain where they're at for another 40 years. That generation, including Moses, does not get to go in because they're not ready, because of their very small and lack of faith. They're not ready to get into the land, so that generation has to die, and a new generation comes in. And that's where the book of Deuteronomy comes into play. It's like the epilogue. Looking towards the future, recalling the past. But Deuteronomy is one big covenant book. It's like, it's all about God presenting to this new generation, okay, the rules and regulations of this, again, of this new generation of how they should act in this new land. Okay. But we're going to see that this covenant in Deuteronomy is going to be different than the other covenants. It's going to treat... Israel more as a vassal state. You know what a vassal state is? It's when someone bigger, a nation bigger, comes in and says, hey, you small little scrawny nation, you know, give us some cash and we won't destroy you and we'll protect you. And you really don't have a choice. And the small little puny nation says, okay, here's some cash. Okay, thanks for not killing us. And that's kind of the treaty, the covenant that God establishes with Deuteronomy. It's a step backwards. It's a step from sons and daughters of God the Father and God's chosen people to like, okay, you're not ready. You're not li- ready to live as sons and daughters. So live in a way of which, what, of fearing and honoring, you know. They're not ready for it yet. And then if we break down the book itself, chapters 1 through 11, we're actually going to spend about three weeks on this. Creation, fall, fallen humanity, Noah, the genealogies, which are really cool, actually, believe it or not. The Tower of Babel, okay. It's funny, the Tower of Babel is going to end. Why do people build a tower? Because they want to make a name for themselves. What's the first thing God tells Abraham in chapter 12? I'm going to make your name great. The people were trying to make their names great themselves, and God's going to show us, nope, nope, it's going to be me that's going to make your name great. Again, this faith, this revelation is all about what God descended and coming to us. Not us building a tower to reach him. Okay. A couple more things. This is, try to remember these last three slides as we move into the text next week. Okay, because... They're going to give us the time frame. Again, my map's coming up soon, so I'm really excited. Okay, all right. The time frame for the Pentateuch. When we look at Genesis, we're going to look at from the creation to the death of Moses. That's covering a lot of ground, okay? But 1450 to 1250 B.C., roughly, okay? And Abraham to Moses is going to be 2000 to 1250 B.C. So the second bullet point here, 2000 to 1250 B.C., that's, that's the ground we're going to cover. Now, we'll leave it up to the scholars and the smart people as to determine when this book of Genesis was actually written. Uh, when I was in the seminary, we were taught this document hypothesis theory where the book of Genesis, along with the other Pentateuch, was written around 500, 400 B.C., you know, written around that time. Again, kind of writing these stories to fit their agenda. Um, there is a movement now that finds some problems with that theory and want to say, well, no. A lot of the texts probably did date to around the time of Moses, and maybe some of the texts was even written by Moses himself. Okay. All right. We'll leave that up to the people to debate. Again, if you read uh, Brad Petrie's book um, in the introduction of the Old Testament he went literally into like 10 to 15 pages on this subject I wasn't going to do that to you okay but I'm going to assume that a lot of this text 
did originate around the time of Moses. You know, and that also that these ancient people had a better sense of oral tradition and whole history than we do today. We say, well, how can they remember all that through generations and generations? Well, they had to. They had, they had no other choice. And their family and their lineages is something that is absolutely important to them. And it kind of is important to us to now, to, today too, as well. We, we, we spend 70 bucks and we, we spit in a cup and we send it to some, you know, g- genetic company to find out our own origins and who our family, you know, uh, family line, lineages and what cultures that we have. Well, I think it's just as important to them as well. And they didn't have books or resources. No, they, they memorized. And they memorized and they memorized. And if we're kind of under this kind of prideful thing where we feel as if we're so smart and brilliant and people in ancient cultures were dumb and, and Neanderthals, just remember that there are literally still structures standing today where we scratch our heads and we say, how in the world did they build those things? You know? How did they build those things? So, that's just my little, uh, little, little side note there. Again, not the most exciting topic, but we're going to come across these figures in Scripture, so it will be good to know who they are. Okay, these first two, the Sumerians and the, uh, the, Ak- the Akadans, okay, probably butchered that name. These two aren't in Genesis, but these, their culture, their traditions still exist during the time of Abraham, okay? So, like, uh, the, the Akadans, okay, their language is kind of like what Latin is to us in the book of Genesis. It's a classical language, okay? But when you, when you look at these two cultures, you're going to see that they had stories talking about a flood. You see that they have genealogies. And you see that they even have creation stories. And when you look at these stories, you're going to be like, oh, well, there's some similarities to the book of Genesis, but also there's going to be some very substantial differences. Okay? And, that, and the important part is, is what are the differences? Because you are going to learn what our faithful brothers and sisters, our Jewish people, contribute as far as the understanding of creation and the human person. Everything that people say today about God, oh, God is love, and God accepts everybody. Yeah, where do you think you got that from? You got that from the Judeo-Christian tradition. Because when you look at these texts about creation and how the human person is formed in these cultures... It's definitely much different than what is presented to us and what we're going to see next week in the book of Genesis. But these next two, you will see in the book of Genesis. These are going to be the cultures around Abraham's time, the Hittites and the Canaanites. Okay? Who are the Hittites? Well, I'm so excited. I want to go to my map, but I'm going to just wait. Okay, let me just read here. Okay? All right. Hittites, 1800 to 1200 BC, they are European, okay? They come from the Northwest, okay? So again, when I show my map, I'll show you where they come from, okay? A lot of their empire stretches down into modern-day Turkey and into close to Syria. So in fact, when Abraham, I believe when Abraham wants to bury his wife Sarah, he buys some land. Who is he buying from? buys them from the Hittites, okay? Because they're one of the world powers they're in charge during Abraham's time, okay? They're going to have ritual tests and laws that resemble the priestly laws in the Pentateuch. So when you know what their priestly laws were, okay, it's going to have a better appreciation as to our own priestly laws that we see, especially in the book of Leviticus. And they also have texts that shed light on covenants, so, when we look at Abraham, and when God tells Abraham to get, a, to get a heifer, to get a goat, and to cut it in two, we're like, wow, that is so weird and disgusting. But to a person reading it in, in Abraham's time, or to an ancient person reading the text, when they hear those words, they immediately go to what? Oh, a goat cut in half. Oh my goodness, God wants to form a covenant with Abraham. 
like, like the ancient reader will immediately pick up on that. Today we look at it and we're like, ew, that's disgusting. <laughs> okay, why is he doing that? That poor, harmless, innocent animal. Okay, but the ancient covenant. Wow. God wants to form a covenant with Abraham. Hmm. Canaanites. Not a nation, but a collection of city-states. Okay, so what's a city-state? A city is just like a, like a city that has its own governance. Okay, so it's kind of like New York City being its own country, or Philadelphia being its own country. That's what the Canaanites were. They weren't like a collective group of people. It was just these sporadic groups, these sporadic cities all over the place in the land of Israel. Okay. They often were fighting with each other. They have various pagan beliefs, including, including the chief God, uh, uh, God is Baal. Okay, get used to that name, B-A-L-L. All right. Um, and the gods of the Canaanites were often violent and sexually perverse. And the heart of the Israelites are going to have a hard time leaving these Canaanite gods. They, can, they, they can't give it up. That's going to be, we're talking about we each have our own weaknesses in life. The weakness of the Hebrew people in general is that they just can't seem to leave those foreign gods behind. And it often happens when? When they're in trouble. When there's a trial. And instead of abandoning themselves to the living God, they, they go to the foreign gods. And we might look at them and say, oh, wow, how could they do that? They're so stupid. But I guarantee you, if you look and search long and deep enough, we do the same thing. What are the foreign gods we go to in our trials? Could be like our own pride. Like, okay, I got I to gotta take control of the situation. It could be something material, something pleasurable, whatever it is. When we're stressed and anxious and when life is weighing us down, do we abandon ourselves with empty hands to the living and true God? Or do we, what? Do we go to the run to the foreign Canaanite gods? Something to explore. But we're just as guilty as they are. I think if we look long and hard and deep enough. Yeah, all right. Okay. So I took a picture of Google Earth which is my, probably my favorite app on the whole computer there. Um, if you ever explore, they have a button that like, looks like a dice. So you just hit the button and they just take you to a random place in the random world. It is so cool when you're bored, okay? You know, like just seeing things and uh, all these things. So I drew some lines which might be hard to see here. Um, let me, this is the world, this is the Genesis world right here. Okay, so you have these two blue lines here. They should probably also run all the way down here to the sea here. These are the two rivers, the Tigris, uh, Tigris and the Euphrates. Okay, these are the two main water rivers that make up this whole region called Mesopotamia. Okay, Mesopotamia means the middle rivers, I believe. I could be wrong on that. Okay, um, if you know anything about ancient history, um, Wherever there's fresh water, that's where you're going to have the civilizations, okay? So you notice like this brown stuff here, okay? Nobody's, very few people are living here. And I would probably even say today, few, very few people are living here, okay? Very dry, barren, no water, okay? But here, you see this green line here? This is where there's water, okay? Formed by these two mighty rivers that lead down into the, I want to say, the Arabia Sea down here. Okay, but then you have like, um, what do you call those little rivers that flow from the bigger rivers, like tributaries? Yeah, that's it. Okay, tributaries running down into here. We know about here, uh, the Jordan River, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee here. But you can see in this region, this is one of Israel's major problems as a nation. So if you're down here in Egypt or anywhere else down here, sorry, the, there we go, back again. Okay. And you want to get over here, you can't just cut across, okay? Your troops won't make it. Your people won't make it, okay? You can just see, again, 
how, how dry and barren this middle ground is here, right below the green line here. So you have to go up. You have to, follow, again, follow this path. And so Israel is just right in the middle of a major trade way, major military advantage way. I mean, that's part of its downfall, in a sense. You know, why they have, always have so much trouble as a nation, why there's always so much foreign harassment. It's a very strategic, important piece of land here. Okay, to get up to here, to get over here, to get down here, you have to go through this area right here. Okay. So this whole green region here is um, Mesopotamia, the Hittite Empire. So the capital, I had it marked up here. Yeah, here it is. Uh, you, can, you can barely see it, but there's a word here. Um, oh, boy. Hat, hat, to, sus, hat to sus. Okay, <laughs> that's the capital of the Hittite Empire. So it will go expand up to here into Greece. This is modern day Turkey, they call or Asia Minor. Again, it would extend down into here. Okay, Abraham, you see these lands down here? This is where the Sumerians, the first group of people, okay, they settled down in here. The Akkadids, okay, came down from here, eventually took over the Sumerians and then the Hittites kind of through their waste and authority into this area as well. Abraham started here. Right here, there's a city called Ur, you are. Way out over here. And he's supposed to go over here. But again, his pathway wasn't straight across. He wouldn't have made it. He has to go up, up the rivers. Okay, up the rivers and down and so forth. And I would assume somewhere in this area here, is where he brought the plot of land to bury Sarah. I could be wrong on that, but I know he, he bought a plot, plot of land for some reason. I'm almost positive it's before burial of his wife. So when the Israelites form a country here and they're exiled by the Babylonians, where do they go? Back to here. So it starts here, and then 2 Kings ends with the people going back to this region. Because you know sometimes in life you just got to start over and if you're one of those that's like boy I, i've really gone away from my faith and boy i i just lost connection with god okay well go back go back to your roots you lost your way all right well let's start with let's start with the mass because the Mass is going to give you so much more than what you think you're going to put into it. You're going to get so much more from it. You know, start with prayers. Start with the sign of the cross. So just like the Israel people where Abraham starts here and makes his way over here, then you get to Second Kings and this great nations, both the southern and northern kingdom are conquered, and many of the people are exiled back to over here. Because why? Well, because they were not faithful to God. They, they ran to the foreign gods. They didn't listen to the word of God. They didn't listen to the prophets. And so they just had to start over. One of the things that you're going to learn is, even as we break the covenants, and as the people break the covenants, and we think God is punishing them, and God is just angry, vindictive God, really it's more, it's more that God's also merciful. Think about this. We'll talk about this next week, so I'll give you a little, little thing here. Adam and Eve, they broke the covenant. They leave the Garden of Eden, and they're separated from God. And death came into the picture for them, eventually. And again, you think, well, wow, they, they, they ate an apple, and God's so mean that, that they're going to die. But you're thinking of it the wrong way. Think of it this way. If they didn't die, and that is they lived it forever, and they had this immortality to them, that means they would live forever as separated from God. You see, death is both an act of justice, but also an act of mercy. Because now that they die, now God seems to have this power to recreate. 
You're going to see this in the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Not only does God have the power to create, he has the power to recreate. He's pretty good at it, too. Last slide. Covenant. Main important thing here. Covenant defined as the extension of kingship by an oath or sacred family bond. Extension of kingship. So just think about this. If covenants is about what? About creating and former families, then what in the world is God doing forming covenants with us? Boy. The Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, for some mysterious reason, wants us to enter into kingship with him. That's why you exist. That's why you're here. Not here in this church. That's why you're just here. Why you're somebody rather than nobody. God wants to have you enter into a kingship, into a family with him. And you didn't deserve it. And it wasn't because you're so great and cool. You are, but that wasn't the reason. Okay. A permanent way, create a family, sacred. And that these covenants are solemnized by an oath, and an oath ritualized as a sacrifice. So you make an oath, and then you make a sacrifice. And we're gonna, I'm going to explain. I'm going to leave some things for you to keep coming back. Well, why do we need a sacrifice? Well, we'll explain that. Okay. Often a sign was given to mark the members of this covenant. Well, I'll show you, I'll show you the sign that Abraham was given. You might already know what it is. Hmm. A family meal often follows the ritual as well. Hmm. Drawing a blank here, help me out here. Where else do we, as Catholics today, we offer a sacrifice and then we consume a meal at the end of it? Anybody know? Anybody know where we do that? I just tell me, ask me afterwards. Just help refresh my memory. And there's often laws expressing the obligations of the covenant that were also given. Okay, the law given, and that's it. Ah, okay. Yeah, the covenant is all about mass because, you know, at, at the mass, you can uh, go. Okay, thank you. Okay. At the mass, we, we see, Father, you know, we, we look at Father Miller or we look up to see Father Kuna, okay, and, and uh, you know, he says, take this, all of you, and drink of it, for this is the blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant. I mean, the elevation of the bread, the elevation, well, the host of the body of Christ at that point, that is my mistake. Okay, the elevation of the chalice, I mean, really, that's, that's the highlight. But they're also words of the covenant. And, and again, I know I repeat the word, and there's going to be so much more that's going to be said with this. It is going to be, hopefully for you, the most important thing in your life. And it will give your life a sense of meaning and purpose. That God, again, created you, formed you, gave you certain jobs and skills and and certain vocations in life. But it all comes down to however it is your path and your life takes you, it all ends in the same way. A God, for some reason, brings you and I into existence so that we can be his beloved sons and daughters in the most realist and truest sense. Just like for those that adopt kids, they're really their kids, <laughs> you know? It, it's, it, it's really, it, it, they're really theirs. And even more so with God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we, we ask you um, to increase our faith and to increase our trust um, that you're God, that you, through your promises, you want, to, you want to give us many graces, many blessings in life. You want us to present to you every single little thing that bothers us, that, that robs us of the peace of our hearts. To place that and, and to present that to you. 
for you to be our model, our guide, and through your help, through your grace, to lead us to the promises of your covenant, eternal life with you. And we ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon you, remain with you forever. Amen. All right, um, if you want to do homework assignment, get your Bible, read Genesis chapters 1 and Genesis chapter 2, okay? They're going to be the two creation stories. Again, the first 11 chapters, we're going to go through it slowly, and then when we get to chapters 12 and 50, it'll only be three or four sessions as we look at each patriarchs. But other than that, we'll, um, we'll conclude. Um, and if there's any questions, feel free to come up to me and ask me afterwards. Thank you, and God bless. Yeah, um, it could help, sure. And um, how many people are here now? Five, six, seven, maybe I'll make about 30, 30 copies if this is too much for you and your neck hurts and you can't see it like I can't. I'll bring some paper copies that I have right in front of you to, for, for you to keep, okay? Um, maybe if you wanna bring a folder or something, you can put them in a binder, you know, those types of things. I'll bring a hole puncher, but just don't get the little paper holes on the floor, all right? All right, thanks guys, God bless.